What I'm going to try to do is collapse a section of that tube to seal us off from the fire and try to plug that leak. I have to use an explosive. Oh, wait, please, let me explain. Another please, explosion? Please. That's your idea down here? No wonder you got people killed. Oh, here we go now. Into the tunnel of love. What are we doing on time? Traffic's a mess. But if we take the tunnel, we'll just make it. This tunnel was drawn up by Edward Trammell in 1918 on a napkin in a Manhattan tavern. The tunnel, which runs under 24 feet of riverbed and 72 feet of water, is deep. <laughs> He's a goddamn genius. Right into the tunnel. What the hell is that? Oh, we got a live one here. Get a crew ready. We did a simulation, they'll all be dead before you get through dead. Look, I know you ran a drill in 94, but right now, you're not running a goddamn thing. That tunnel is sealed from both ends. I mean, the mid-river here is like hanging, like, 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 like pickup sticks. Now, what the hell's the way in, huh? Yeah. How many people are left alive down there? There's uh, maybe a dozen, and uh, we're in the middle of the tunnel. Tell them we're coming down right now. Am I wrong in saying that you don't really know whether there's anyone alive to transmit, period? We saw people! We're gonna break through from the Manhattan side. That's the consensus of the city engineers. If you bring in the heavy equipment and cause a pressure shift, the whole damn thing could implode. We're gonna drown down here and he's all we've got! The only thing I know is we're not gonna make it another hour unless I shut this thing down! Are we gonna get out of here? Wait, wait. I just need some time to figure it out. Daylight exploded onto the big screen in the USA on the 6th of December 1996 and arrived in the UK on the 26th of that month. Directed by Rob Cohen who had just directed the hit fantasy adventure film Dragonheart and produced by Raffaella De Laurentiis. The film was made on a large budget of $18 million and pulled in $160 million worldwide making it a moderate hit. It certainly didn't perform well in the USA, only pulling in 33 million, far lower than its budget, but thankfully worldwide sales saved it from being another failure for the action star Sylvester Stallone, whose previous two films, Jaws Dread and Assassins, failed to make an impact the year before. Critics at the time were very mixed on Daylight, many praised its visual effects, its premise and Randy Elderman's score. Empire Magazine gave it a glowing review, but on the other side of the coin it made Gene Siskel's list of the worst movies of 1996, and Roger Ebert himself was also unimpressed with the film. To add further damage, it unfortunately received two Golden Raspberry Awards, for the Worst Actor Award for Stallone and Worst Original Song, titled Whenever There Is Love, performed by Bruce Roberts and Donna Summer. The film would, however, prove popular with the rental market and home video sales. Universal Pictures released a special edition Laserdisc as part of their signature collection, loaded with special features and an audio commentary. These extras would later get ported over to DVD and Blu-ray. Stallone years later would comment on the quality of the film, saying he felt it was a good premise that didn't deliver. As the 90s saw a number of disaster movies such as Twister, Volcano, Dante's Peak, Deep Impact and Armageddon, Daylight got lost in the mayhem and became a bit of a forgotten entry in Stallone's long-running career. Writer Les Boehm had come up with the script to Daylight after reading about a real disastrous event that occurred in the Holland Tunnel in May of 1949. A truck carrying hazardous materials caught fire while passing through the tunnel, which travelled under the Hudson River between New York City and New Jersey. The fire nearly caused the tunnel to collapse. It resulted in one firefighter being killed and 66 civilians being injured as a result of the accident. 
The script was passed on to director Rob Cohen, who was working on Dragonheart at the time, and Rob was impressed and thought it would be a great return to the disaster movies of the 70s, with hopes to give it a modern twist making use of state-of-the-art visual effects. Rob himself was involved in a near-death experience when he was trapped in a hotel that caught fire in 1979. He recalled seeing the wallpaper peel off the walls due to the heat, and being saved at the last minute by the firefighter watching the hotel windows behind him explode that harrowing experience and what he witnessed he would translate onto film. With Rob on board and Raffaella De Laurentiis producing, they needed a lead to play as Kit Latura, the hero of the story. Rob at first apparently wanted Nicolas Cage, but Universal Pictures who were funding the film and distributing it worldwide wanted a bigger name feeling Cage was more of a character actor, and Stallone was suggested due to being more commercially viable. Rob phoned Sly and offered him the part. He mentioned Daylight would be a good successor to Cliffhanger. In that movie, Stallone had to conquer his fears of heights, and Stallone said to Rob he hates being wet on set and suffers from claustrophobia. Rob said Daylight would be another great opportunity for him to really challenge his fears. The part would also not be a traditional action lead. Stallone, for example, wouldn't be showing off his muscles. Stallone, during the early press for Daylight, felt he was getting too old for the action genre and wanted to move away from it. Sly eventually agreed and accepted the job, but of course at the time Stallone was charging nearly $20 million per picture, and he got the paycheck he wanted. To fill out the rest of the cast, we have Amy Brennanham as Madeline, a struggling playwright who has decided to move out of New York City when the tunnel explosion traps her inside. Amy starred in the popular show NYPD Blue and made the jump to film with Casper and Heat. Amy still works steadily today on TV with the recent show Goliath. Stan Shaw plays as George Tyrell, a transit cop trapped in the tunnel by the explosion and keeps these survivors together to maintain high spirits. A familiar face on the big screen starring in Rocky, The Monster Squad, The Box Office Flop, Cutthroat Island, Snake Eyes and more recently in Jeepers Creepers 3. Viggo Mortensen plays as Roy Nord, a rich sporting goods celebrity known for doing commercials, gets trapped in the tunnel and decides to make his own way out, but his ego gets in the way of him knowing the true danger he is in. Rob Cohen saw Viggo in Crimson Tide and was impressed with him and cast him in Daylight. Viggo's career really took off once he was cast in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. J.O. Sanders stars as Stephen Crichton, who was taking his wife and daughter to New York to patch up his strained relationship with them, after cheating on his wife and gets caught up in the explosion, trapping all three of them in the tunnel. Jay has starred in many films and TV shows and appeared in another disaster movie with The Day After Tomorrow in 2004. Karen Young plays as Sarah Stevens' wife. Karen starred in the hilariously awful Jaws the Revenge early on in her career. She would go on to have a very successful acting career on TV, starring in shows such as The Sopranos and Law and & Order Special Victims Unit. Danielle Harris plays as Ashley, their daughter. Danielle started acting at an early age, becoming a familiar face of the horror genre, starring in Halloween 4 and 5, Urban Legends and the Rob Zombie remake of Halloween. Colin Fox stars as Roger Trilling, an elderly man trapped alongside his wife Eleanor and their late son's dog Cooper in the tunnel. Colin had been acting since the late 60s, mainly focused on TV and as a voiceover actor, working on cartoons such as The Legend of Zelda and Beetlejuice, and still works steadily today. Claire Bloom plays as Roger's wife, Eleanor. Claire has had a long-running career on film and TV, starring in classics such as Laurence Olivier's Richard III, Clash of the Titans, and more recently playing as Queen Mary in The King's Speech. The late Sage Stallone plays as Vincent, a young con artist going to juvenile prison, when the explosion traps him and other delinquents in the tunnel. Sage was cast due to Rob Cohen needing another prisoner on the bus, and Sly suggested his own son. Sage auditioned like everyone else and got the part. Sage got his first acting gig playing Rocky's son in Rocky V. Sage unfortunately didn't have a big career as an actor and attempted to shift his career into directing. Sadly, he passed away in 2012 due to a heart attack at the young age of 36. For the other prisoners on the bus, we have Renolais Santiago as Mickey. Renolais starred in Dangerous Minds and went on to appear in Hackers and Con Air. Trina McGee plays as Latonia. Trina is probably best known for starring in the popular kids show Boy Meets World. And we have Marcelo Thedford as Kadeem. Marcelo also starred in Dangerous Minds alongside Renolais. He had a part in Crimson Tide and after Daylight appeared in another disaster film, Volcano. And last we have the director Rob Cohen getting two cameos in the film, the first being as Madeline's ex-boyfriend on the phone and the other working for Roy Nord's company. 
when it came time to shooting the film, the producers were scouting for studios to build the tunnel to set most of the movie. They had looked at using Pinewood Studios, but they didn't meet their requirements. Raffaella suggested shooting in Eastern Europe to keep costs down, but Sly didn't really want to travel that far to film. So they made use of Cinecittà Studios in Rome, which had floodable sound stages and a space to build the tunnel, which would stretch a third of a mile and 90% of the movie would take place in there. And the set would have to be redressed seven times to reflect the changes of conditions and damages as the water rises. The shoot in Rome would last about three months. All the cars featured in the tunnel were shipped over from the USA to Italy to keep up the illusion that it takes place stateside. They spent a couple of weeks in New York capturing all the exterior sequences and made use of the Midtown Tunnel in New York to film the entrance. They would manage to close the tunnel over a couple of nights to dress the location to capture the commuters stuck in traffic before the disastrous event. The film opens in New York with a waste management firm illegally shifting barrels of toxic waste across the city to New Jersey to avoid paying environmental fees. As the drivers make their way across the city to the Holland Tunnel, we are introduced to the other commuters, a struggling playwright, a bus of young offenders, a family on vacation, an elderly couple with their dog and a popular retail sports manager Roy Nord. Across town, a gang of punks steal some gems and escape in a car and narrowly avoid the NYPD and speed into the tunnel. The gang push their way through the traffic and the driver loses control, smashing through a security booth and into one of the trucks containing the toxic waste, causing it to detonate resulting in a massive explosion. A devastating fireball sweeps through the tunnel, destroying the entrances and burning the majority of the motorists within it. Former Emergency Medical Services Chief Kit Latoura, who now works as a taxi driver, is approaching the Manhattan end of the tunnel and slams on the brakes as the fire shoots out of the tunnel destroying the entrance. Kit helps some of the other commuters hurt in the accident and bumps into his old EMS colleague. He tries to offer advice but due to being fired from the EMS, the commanding officer doesn't want to listen to him. Kit decides to speak with the tunnel administrators and finds out the best route into the tunnel and that is through the ventilation system, which is highly risky as they can only be turned off for a limited amount of time. The survivors trapped in the tunnel see Nord as their best way out, as he believes he can find a way through the mid-river passage. Kit arrives by breaking through a manhole and finds Nord, warning him that the passage could come down at any moment, but Nord dismisses the possibility. Kit barely escapes as the mid-river collapses, killing Nord and causing another explosion. Water begins leaking in from the river above, and Kit uses an explosive to stop the leak. George returns from investigating the Manhattan End and is crushed under a truck as the road cracks. The group manage to free him before he can drown but he's left with a broken neck. The water level continues to rise and the angry survivors confront Kit about his past and question if he really knows what he is doing. With the water rising and the survivors losing faith in him, he needs to find another exit before it's too late. The visual effects for Daylight were largely handled by Industrial Light and Magic, with help from Vision Art, Pacific Ocean Post and Illusion Arts. The film incorporates in-camera effects, miniatures, CGI and digital map paintings. The film's biggest display of effects is the explosive in the tunnel that lasts for roughly two minutes. Rob Cohen worked with the storyboard artist to break down each shot and met with the FX team to decide how each shot could be achieved for the best results to make it as believable as possible. The miniature effects work is really spectacular during this sequence, as we see the cars get crushed by the tunnel walls as they collapse around them. Granted, there are one or two miniature shots that don't quite work as well, as the scale of the cars seem a bit off. I love the shot of the flames blasting through these doors as they shoot up and destroy the tower on the New Jersey side, and the builder just shouts out, Jesus Christ! which is really effective in bringing across the horror and sudden shock of the carnage. When replicating fire in CGI, it often provided inconsistent results during the 90s, sometimes looking too flat and stuck on. But in the case of Daylight, the flame effects have stood up well as we see it destroy the vehicles. For the finale, as we see Kit and Maddie escape from the tunnel with a blowout effect, ILM handled this sequence with the actors and camera on wires to simulate being underwater. This effect is called dry for wet, often used to avoid filming underwater and putting any actors at risk. ILM used computer effects to simulate mud and dirt, which do look very convincing. As CGI became more affordable through the 90s, we saw many films incorporating the technology and often abusing it, resulting in effects that have struggled to stand up over time. 
Come the late 90s, FX artists and directors were using it when it was really needed, so we had a mix of miniatures, matte paintings and CGI, so films such as Starship Troopers, Dante's Peak and Titanic have stood up well to scrutiny and I think Daylight nicely fits into that list. Randy Edelman composed a score to Daylight. Randy had worked with Rob Cohen on Dragon the Bruce Lee's story and Dragonheart from the year before, and Daylight would be his first disaster flick. Fans of the composer's work are probably familiar with his style of combining synthesized keyboarding and a moderate orchestra, and usually mixed with an array of percussive beats and modern rhythms. During the 90s, action scores had taken a shift in style. The late 80s we had Hans Zimmer bringing his style and approach to Black Rain, then Mark Mancina really set the tone with Speed and Bad Boys. The same year Daylight came out, composer John Debney had scored the Van Damme movie Sudden Death, and both films have a similar sound and approach to how the music would represent the action. If you watch the trailer for Daylight and the featurette produced at the time of its release, they actually make use of the Sudden Death score. The main theme which gets used throughout the film establishes a pace to the music, with a keyboard motif with a solo piano performance that foreshadows a danger coming. It's an enjoyable theme and simple in its execution that rises and falls, helping visualise a sense of heavy traffic. Randy gives the score a sense of suspense that really helps in underscoring the survivors who are running out of time. There is an emotional and heroic theme for Latora, who is out to seek redemption for his past mistakes, and Randy gives the score the right tone to help the audience get behind Stallone's character. It's a really enjoyable score to listen to by itself. There isn't a huge amount of variety of themes throughout, but Randy provides enough action cues to please fans of the genre. The CD release of the score arrived when the film came out, featuring 14 tracks of his work and two additional pop songs, one titled Whenever There Is Love by Bruce Roberts and Donna Summer, and the other titled Don't Go Out With Your Friends Tonight by Ho Hum, which are a bit crap. <laughs> the CD has been out of print for years and has never been re-released or put out with an expanded version. You can thankfully get it on digital platforms such as iTunes, and certainly worth seeking out if you're a fan of Randy's work and love action scores. I saw Daylight when it first hit cinemas in the UK. I must have watched it in early January of 1997 as it was still playing at my local Warner Village cinema. It was the first Stallone movie I could see on the big screen. I was too young to see Judge Dredd which came out two years earlier. The hype for the movie was quite strong. The trailers were impressive and seeing snippets of the opening explosive sequence was certainly a good reason to go see it. Disaster movies are always best to watch on the big screen and Daylight somewhat delivered in satisfying my hunger for some good action and it was nice to finally watch a Stallone film at the cinema, instead of a worn out VHS tape I would have rented. Despite the film's opening explosive sequence, which kickstarts exactly 15 minutes into the movie, it starts to drag and lose its momentum. I still have a vivid memory of just being blown away by the sound mix, it's just phenomenal. If you have a copy with a DTS soundtrack, then it's definitely worth listening to on a home cinema setup. But in terms of delivering more danger and peril, they really struggled to top the opening act, and the supporting characters we are introduced to really didn't help in keeping me engaged with the film. Over the years I've gone back to it many times, and I certainly have warmed to it more over the years. With all disaster movies, often the most interesting aspect is how the events unfold to the big explosive moment. Dante's Peak has this great build up to the volcano's inevitable eruption that engulfs the town it builds the tension surprisingly well. That movie was also written by Les Burham, who I think does provide a better script for that film. Schlock-like volcano's strongest and interesting aspect is how the lava makes its way to the surface. Everything else about it I personally found laughable. In the case of Daylight, it's not a natural disaster, it's just human error, and dealing with the elements of nature which ultimately isn't very interesting. There's no villain to the piece, the only bad guys are the punks who caused the accident due to poor driving. Come 1996 and using punks to be the bad guys felt very dated. It's something Gene Siskel pointed out, choosing punks were the safest option not to offend anyone, but in reality made it very silly. Once Kit comes to the rescue and attempts to stop the water, the film essentially turns into the Poseidon adventure. Instead of a ship, it's a tunnel that slowly becomes flooded. The biggest issue I have with the film, and had it since I saw it back in early 1997, is the supporting characters. Once Stallone manages to get into the tunnel, they are rude and for the most part really horrible and hostile towards him. He's made to feel like a total shit despite risking his own life to save theirs. Madeline, who you can say is supposed to be a somewhat love interest, is the only one from the beginning to act supportive. She is the first character in the film to take part in an action scene to save the young offenders. 
Kit Latoura has a clear story arc of trying to redeem himself of his past mistakes, but you're sitting there thinking, just leave these people, they're horrible. Stallone is so good at making you feel sorry for him. He really gets across the emotional impact he takes in struggling to save these people and knowing that he may have doomed them all. Of course the survivors start out aggressive and just want results and soon support him, but the fault lies with the writing. They didn't need to be written that way, but you always find in these types of movies characters who are just aggressive, unreasonable and downright annoying for the lead to interact with to create some drama. The authorities as well come across as idiots and heartless. They want to start digging to repair the tunnel, thinking they can get the traffic flowing again, which is insanely stupid. It's going to take months to repair the tunnel, so giving Natura a few more hours to save them is perfectly reasonable. These are the typical checklist of things you need in a disaster movie, making it all too familiar. There are moments where the film is trying to take itself seriously, but it does come across as unintentionally funny. Madeline trying to move the electrical cable, getting thrown around like a rag doll, and George getting sucked under the water as the car falls on him. He lets out this girly scream and I couldn't help but laugh. George is probably the most unfortunate victim of the story. He is written to be a very nice character and was going to propose to his girlfriend and he gets left behind due to being injured. Stallone and Stan do a wonderful job with their scene of them parting ways as Stallone's character has to leave him there to die. After Daylight, Stallone's career as an action star was very much coming to an end. He could no longer be charging producers $20 million per movie. His power at the box office was starting to wane. Stallone himself wanted other roles outside of action and did an incredible job on Copland the following year. But that critical success didn't stay on track and his career nosedived for a number of years starring in Turkey such as the remake of Get Carter, Driven and I See You. It was nearly a decade for him to return to the success of his past with Rocky Balboa and Rambo 4 and he kickstarted a new action series with The Expendables. Daylight is certainly not a bad film but it is a bit forgettable. The visual effects as stated earlier are very impressive and they still hold up very well today thanks to the large amount of miniatures and in-camera effects. Stallone despite later on saying they didn't deliver on the movie, I feel is probably right. I think it's a perfectly fine disaster flick though that would entertain most people on a Friday or Saturday night when it's the best time to watch a movie with your friends or your partner. This I would say is probably the last of Stallone's most physically demanding roles. He appears to be doing a lot of his own stunts and Daylight would make a great double bill with Clint. Cliffhanger. But if you had to compare the two, Cliffhanger would easily be the winner thanks to a stronger cast of characters and there being far more action and adventure on display. Ultimately what lets Daylight down is its supporting characters and struggle to throw in more action and peril to really keep up the threat that they may never escape. Having this big opening sequence made it really tough for the filmmakers to come up with something more exciting. You have an impressive sequence of Stallone making his way through these giant fans, but it goes on for a bit too long, and then once he gets into the tunnel, it just becomes this race to avoid drowning. They threw in some additional explosions, but unfortunately that's not enough to really keep one excited to the very end. It's a well-made movie, there's no doubt about that. It has a lot of talented people on the production, but sadly it doesn't really deliver on the expectations of the genre. It's watchable and Stallone does give it his all, but I think it's fair to say that it's an overall disappointing big budget movie with Sly in the lead to wrap up his 90s career as an action star. If you want to buy some time, you're going to blow the tunnel shut. What are you doing here, kid? You're not part of this. I know you know your job, but we did a simulation. They'll all be dead before you get through dead. You don't get it, do you? You don't work here anymore. All right. Devil, Wilson, if I could just talk on. to you for a minute. Come on, kid. He's going to have you arrested. Look, you got to blow the tunnel shut. Talk to him. You owe me that, Frank. Frank. Are you the acting chief for what? Yeah, kid, I'm the acting chief. So why don't you act? It's past history. It's got nothing to do with this situation. Now, you're wrong about that. I had to take a chance, now you do. I was in the same situation as you. Now, what are you going to do, Frank? There's nothing to think about here. It's three hours. Frank, it's three hours. We are time poor. That tunnel is an artery. The city is bleeding. If you try to redirect half a million people in and out of this city without that tunnel, you got a problem that you don't want to think about. What are you saying? Are you saying that because of a traffic problem, you're giving up on possible survivors? Come on, man, you gotta hold off on the drill. Look, city engineers make the decisions. You clean up the mess. How'd you get fired? Hmm. Long story, I wouldn't worry about it. Shh! 
She said she read you got people killed. She's right. She mentioned it was a building collapse in the South Bronx. Jay Gad's main blew on the way out. Three men died. So you never had a way out of here, did you? I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to subscribe to see more retrospectives and commentaries. Also click on the bell to be notified of the latest reviews. If you want access to exclusive videos and to watch my content a few days before it's on YouTube, you can head on over to my Patreon. Thank you very much.